I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Dom Yip and Kevin Wilson. Dom is our Director of Sales Engineering, and Kevin is our Senior Product Manager, and also the former CISO of Guess Incorporated. Before I hand the mic over to Dom and Kevin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this presentation. First, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speakers, please submit it using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question today, during today we will follow up afterwards. Um, and next, today's session is being recorded um, and a link to access it on demand will be available following today's event. So for, without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming today's speakers. Dom and Kevin, over to you. All right, thank you, Leah. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Good, Dom, how are you? Awesome, doing great. Uh, thanks for joining me for the uh, webinar today. Um, so we're gonna, as Leah mentioned, we're gonna talk about Office 365. And uh, you know, we're gonna go through uh, a few topics today in regards to uh, you know, what are the challenges that we're seeing with our customers that are on O365. You know, what can we do to secure it? Uh, and then some best practices and then uh, you know, kind of general uh, conversations around you know, cloud security as well from uh, an email perspective. So let's get started today. So, you know, today in this age of COVID, you know, a lot of us are, you know, really working from home, right? So, and I think there's definitely been a pressure to kind of move a lot of services towards, you know, cloud-based services. Uh, and I think Microsoft has done a really solid job here, you know, to migrate a lot of their own customers towards the cloud, right? So if you remember a few years ago, a few years ago there was this whole initiative of, you know, to the cloud, right? Um, and, and from a, you know, a, an administrative perspective, from an O365 user's perspective, right, moving all my exchange infrastructure into that O365 environment definitely does make a big difference, right? Not having to go and chase, you know, rate arrays, managing containers, all the hard part of managing an exchange environment, uh, you know, definitely has made that a lot easier. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, this also applies to, to you know, the folks that have moved to Gmail as well. You know, there's always this little battle between, you know, Google and Microsoft at the top here and, you know, how do they capture those mailboxes. Uh, but definitely the trend is happening. You know, you know, uh, you know, the Microsoft CEO here definitely did highlight, you know, this, extru this exponential growth that they're seeing here. And this is across all services, right? So, uh, you know, this is, you know, that transition is just accelerating uh, with this, you know, kind of challenging times that we have today. And, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, uh, you know, out there are kind of working through the, that transition or, you know, are somewhere in that transition. Uh, so the challenge that we see with all our customers uh, with O365 is that, you know, not only that, you know, that transition to the cloud is happening as well, but they're also being challenged with budgets, right? So if you look at, you know, a lot of companies out there, you know, sales may be down, especially if you rely on moving people around or if you're, uh, you know, your, your stuff that people don't necessarily spend money as much because of, of the pandemic and, you know, all the challenges that we're facing. Um, so, so a lot, we see a lot of companies getting to a point where, you know, not only that they're, uh, you know, spending less on IT, but they're also starting to cut budgets and attackers, you know, know that, right. Attackers take every opportunity they can in order to breach infrastructure, to try to steal data, to get financial gain. And what we see is, and, and you guys are very much aware of the statistics, right? 95% of cybersecurity incidents typically start with a phishing campaign, right? Um, and the attackers not only know that you guys are dropping your defenses, but also their entry point is a lot easier as well, right? So, for me to go out and register a real O365 account, it's only a few dollars. If I do it on Google, it's even cheaper, right? Masquerading my, my domains that I'm registering to try to fool you is also even easier to do, right? So there's you know, 1,500 plus TLDs out there that I can use to try to mimic your domain, right? Um, and also anything around email authentication can easily be deployed. That doesn't actually cost me anything. That's just you know, DNS records that I have to push there, right? So, so I, I think we're faced from multiple angles here, uh, you know, multiple aspects that make these campaigns a lot harder to detect. And the evolution that we're gonna see across the different campaigns, the different tactics attackers are doing, uh, makes it even more challenging. Um, so Kevin, you know, I know, you know, when you were the, the, uh, the, the CISO, I guess here, you know, I. I I remember when we started talking, you guys were kind of working through this whole migration towards O365. You know, what was your experience there? Well, I mean, anytime you go from on-prem to cloud, there are going to be a lot of challenges. 
uh, really what I had to focus on being, you know, security minded was just how I'm going to start protecting a different type of infrastructure. Um, obviously email security was top of mind, but beyond that really had to focus around where my data was going because as the world kind of shifted into a more of a privacy focused, uh, mindset, it really became important to understand and track where my data was going and, and how the different uh, attack surface looked now that we were in the cloud versus on-prem. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and, and what we're you know, seeing a lot of our you know, customers do is you know, as they transition towards a pure cloud play around just a pure mailbox, right? So there's always this, this assumption of you know, security is going to be built in, right? And I think from a an anti-spam and an anti-virus perspective, you know, the cloud providers out there have done a very good job at, you know, managing those threats, uh, you know, and, and we see this, right? So the way that the engines are designed, the detections that they're making, right? They're very much built to capture spam, right? And, and spam, you know, in a way, if you kind of look at the challenge that you have to deal with there, it's really a volume problem, right? So you get enough samples of what the spam is, you push the rule and then you protect all your users, right? So, uh, but when it comes to phishing, uh, the challenge there, especially around the targeted phishing, there, there's not always a lot of samples. You know, if it's very targeted, you may get a handful of samples and that's typically not enough to write a, a good signature that's not gonna FP a lot uh, and be able to capture those campaigns. And as they grow, then, then the, the similarities to spam kind of starts to, to grow there and those, you know, those, those solutions will eventually catch up. Uh, but that initial phase, we always see the spike happen, um, and then that leaves you know a lot of uh, users vulnerable to those phishing campaigns, right? As I mentioned, you know, th th being reactive there is typically not good enough because the, the attackers know that. So the the quicker they can strike, the more effective they're going to be at their own campaigns. Uh, and also the other challenge that we see with a lot of our O365 customers is that you know out of the box, you know, there's a lot of knobs to adjust, right? Um, it's very difficult to to protect the environment. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily know what you know switch I need to go turned on, right? What the effect that's going to have on my email uh, transport. So, so in, in Microsoft, you know, does not always kind of shepherd you through that process, right? So, so and then the other aspect of it is if you don't necessarily understand how some of these controls work right, you may actually end up whitelisting things you're not supposed to whitelist. And we do have a, a few examples of, of, of attacks that have bypassed whitelisting uh, that, that customers just didn't know what to do or they just thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah, also you have to realize that a lot of the time, O365 isn't managed by a security team. You have a lot of non-security minded folks that are just trying to get uptime versus, you know, understanding the different t attacks and the threats out there. So. Do you really trust your email infrastructure person to be writing your security rules for you? So uh, they're always, you know, the eternal struggle between security and IT comes into play big time when we start talking about email security. That's a really good point, Kevin. Appreciate that. Yeah. So here's a couple examples of, of phishing campaigns that we've seen kind of beat O365, right? So here, uh, you know, attackers know, right? So if they've done a bit of research on you, they'll know that, using, that you're using, you know, a Microsoft infrastructure. And we see this for Google, you know, customers where the emails targeted at them will be Google-centric as opposed to 0365, right? Because if I use the wrong lure, users are going to know, right? They're not going to tap on it, right? So, so here, uh, you know, attackers are, are in a way, you know, as I mentioned, smart. Uh, you know, when they run their campaigns, they'll either use... Uh, compromise credentials or they'll just go out and get free credentials, right? So just use a Google account and AOL account to launch their attacks, right? So these will easily defeat things like email authentication. And if I craft my, you know, my email in a way that can still beat a lot of these uh, detection engines, then, you know, as you see here, this, this email got marked as an SCL of one, right? So I can bury, you know, my, the, the malicious URL, uh, you know, either deep into a structure that Microsoft is just not aware of yet. Or, you know, we've seen this across other campaigns where they'll use actually Microsoft's own infrastructure using SharePoint, using, you know, Live.com, using Azure uh, storage buckets in order to run these campaigns, right? So, and again, you know, if you think that it's legitimate, if it's trusted, you may not inspect it, you know, as deeply as you should. Uh, another type of campaigns that we see 
uh, is uh, attackers nesting URLs, right? So either using shorteners or using redirections to effectively, uh, you know, kind of through browser redirection leads you back to, you know, to that credential harvester, right? So, uh, and often solutions will just look at the first layer, maybe go one layer deeper to figure out what that's taking. So if you redirect, you know, a lot, right, you're going to end up deep in that hole. And again, if you're not checking deep in that hole, you know, that's where that credential harvester is going to sit in there. And from a user's perspective, when I tap on it, those redirections happen so quickly that I don't even know that I'm being redirected, right? So, and, and here, you know, you'll train your users to check the URL bar, you know, check for that little green lock to make sure that the, the website is secured. And often, you know, you, they'll be pointing back to, to something that has a real certificate, right? So, and again, if you're not paying attention, uh, you may easily kind of miss these things. Um, so, so, so this example here is actually a great one, right? A lot of us are, are, are using Zoom uh, for our web conferencing, right? But we've seen different flavors of those going from WebEx, going, going to Microsoft Teams, all exploiting those brands in order to get your users to tap uh, on the links that are, you know, that they're seeing in their email. Here's an, uh, another one that's a little bit more interesting here. Uh, you know, uh, and, and actually this one and, and the, the example before, uh, both of these emails actually originated from uh, Amazon SCS, right? And, and this is a piece of infrastructure that, infrastructure that everybody uses to send, uh, you know, automated mails out or use, you know, that, that cloud infrastructure to send messages out. And in and both of these instances, the, you know, the, the owner of, of those messages effectively just kind of whitelisted SCS because they themselves use it. And they wanted to make sure that, you know, the anti-spam did not flag it as, uh, as, as malicious, right? And, and the challenge when that happens is that the moment you whitelist things, uh, it, it kind of opens the door for attackers to exploit that infrastructure, to ins exploit, uh, you know, that whitelist, right? Um, and in here, uh, you know, the attacker, you know, was spoofing, you know, Bank of America, and also did something a little bit interesting here is that they, they've, they took advantage of the fact that your email client automatically renders a lot of things, right? So the emails, the PDF may show up directly in the email. And in this case, what they've done is they, you know, they've created this bogus email from Bank of America saying like, hey, you know, you receive a secured message, you need to tap on it. Um, but if your, your client was actually just rendering the, the message itself, you'd actually notice that it's just a pure picture that is linked somewhere, right? So, you know, all these things, you know, all the convenience that we get from looking at emails on our phone or looking email on, you know, our email clients, right, sometimes kind of play against us, right? And especially if things get whitelisted, um, you know, that just exposes, you know, our mailboxes to these phishing campaigns from happening. So, 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 so these, you know, in a way are kind of what I call the easy fish to detect, right? They point you a URL, you know, they may be linking you to a malicious file. Uh, but what we're actually seeing is, you know, business mail compromise kind of starting to take the, the top position here in terms of, of threats that are happening across organizations. Uh, you know, the FBI studied this, right? So they, you know, they've accounted for, you know, about 26 billion in financial losses across companies here. You know, eight out of 10 companies get nailed with one of these BC campaigns, right? If you're lucky, right, it's a few gift cards that you sent out. If you're unlucky, you may have moved a few million dollars out, right? And, and often companies never see that money back and it's very challenging. And as we'll see, as, you know, as we see these campaigns evolve, the level of sophistication gets more and more, uh, you know, complicated, um, and and the, and the losses just pile up, right? And 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 we'll talk about the uh, Gartner report a little bit later on here. They themselves ran their own study there, and you know, they, they're by their own calculation, it's not getting any better. So let's jump uh, on the on on this BC uh, evolution here, and you know, like any good evolution, right? The, the pressures that are applied, you know, there's adaptations, right? And the attackers are doing exactly that. They're effectively looking at the defenses that we're putting against them, what we're doing to train our users to protect our organizations, and they're shifting their tactics, right? They're evolving their campaigns to effectively be more uh, effective, and, and, and that effectively increases that level of sophistication, right? So, so if we kind of look at a bit of, of that history here, Right, you know, we've divided uh, those BECs into different types, right? So the type one uh, is what we call a basic BEC. Uh, and then, you know, based on what we've done, it kind of moved to a type two uh, and then a type three. And we're actually starting to see 
traces of what we call a type four, right? So not quite prevalent yet, definitely a lot more sophisticated, but that's definitely happening. And, and if you look at the timelines of that evolution, it's only getting faster, right? So, so attackers here, you know, are in a way kind of know what they're doing and are getting a bit more effective around those attacks. So if we start with the, with the type one, the type one is, is, is kind of like the, the, the basic one, right? So it's the one where an attacker will typically impersonate an executive of the company, right? So it'd be the CEO, the CFO, maybe your boss. Uh, and and there's, there's usually an immediate call to action, right? So, hey, I'm sitting in a meeting. Can you give me a bunch of gift cards? And, or, uh, you know, I just chained banks. Can you give me, uh, I need to update my direct deposit information, right? So, so here, uh, what the attacker does, you know, not only they're impersonating the, in the executive of the company, but they'll typically use a free service to launch their attack, right? So it'll either be a Gmail account or an AOL account. Um, and then the reason that they do that is that, you know, those uh, infrastructures are trusted, right? They have, you know, the right SPF, DKIM, DMARC records published out. So those will, will defeat those, those countermeasures pretty easily, right? So here's a couple examples, right? So Here's the classic one of, uh, I'm sending in me, can you give me a bunch of gift cards, right? Uh, and, and those, you know, the attackers have figured out that, you know what, I don't have to be technical to, to launch one of these attacks, right? This is pure social engineering, right? It's purely taking advantage of the fact that most employees out there, you know, want to be helpful. Uh, you know, if you get an email from your boss or your CEO, well, one, it must be important. And second, you know, most folks don't usually question uh, you know, their bosses when they ask them to do something, right? Uh, the other aspect of it is, you know, if the attacker is smart and they realize that, you know, if I send this at five o'clock on a Friday while you're out picking out the kids and you're rushed and I'm asking you to, to get some gift card, you know, the grocery store might be on the way or the Walmart might be on the way, right? You may just stop by and get me those gift cards and I may, you know, I may have a quick win there, right? So, so here, you know, what makes those detections hard to, to detect is really around the, like I said, there's no technical controls there, there's no file, no attachments. It's really the text, it's really the language in those emails that makes it you know, a, lot, uh, a lot harder to detect and that requires a lot of compute resources in order to be effective there, right? Here's a second example that we have here where you know, this is the, the payroll example, right? Here, Michael, the CEO, is asking uh, Gentle, the, uh, you know, the payroll administrator, to go change their banking information, right? So the tactics here, you know, very similar. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, we see a lot of these campaigns not only happening from free services, but we see a lot of accounts get compromised. Uh, you know, not to, to, to bag on EDUs out there, but we see a lot of university accounts get compromised. We see a lot of, you know, faculty accounts get compromised and taken advantage to launch these attacks here. So if we move to, uh, to the type two here, right? So the type two is really in response to some of the training that we've established with our employees, right? So, so we've, we've started to recognize that, you know, those, those attacks are happening. Now we say, hey, employee, let me push you through training. Let me teach you how to recognize those if you see those happen. Good chances they're bogus. Double check the sender, you know, maybe call the CEO, just verify that it's really, you know, it's happening. You know, don't get, don't get duped by those, right? So, so those pressures that we're putting against the attackers forces them to evolve, force them to adapt, right? So now attackers are now looking at, uh, you know, credentials lists that you're finding on the dark web, right? So, you know, over the last few years, you know, we've all seen this company gets compromised, database gets dumped on the dark web, somebody buys the database, and now they turn around and they try to use those credentials to effectively break into companies, right? And, and this is definitely taking advantage of the fact that, you know, Password controls have not always been there. Uh, users are lazy, right? Users use the same password, right? Somebody can figure out that Mary at Gmail is also Mary at company.com. And Mary, you know, is not very sophisticated, reuses the same password. And now the attacker is taking advantage of the fact of the password has not been changed. It's, it's the same one. I figured that Mary at company.com, if I use that to log in into the Outlook web, right, I can get into the inbox. So now if I'm successful, I'm sitting in the inbox, right? So now I can see what communication Mary is doing. If Mary is not a very interesting target, I can try to start to fish internally to see if I can get to the finance person or if I can get to somewhere more interesting. Maybe I can dupe 
an IT person and then el escalate my, my access, right? Um, or, you know, I can use Mary's account to fish partners of Mary. And this is what we see in the type three, right? Um, and here, you know, the, 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 the challenge here that we have with these type twos is that, you know, often organizations are not necessarily scanning internal traffic, right? They don't necessarily have good controls around protecting those logins. Um, and we've seen you know, over the, the, the last few years as, as those threats have surfaced, you know, companies that are adapting, right? Uh, and this is where, you know, TFA, MFA, right, have been kind of coming in to try to reinforce those, those, uh, those, those controls. Um, and then attackers are definitely evolving here. So let's take a quick look at, at a sample of a type two, right? So here, you know, Barbara got compromised, right? And she started to fish internally, you know, other employees to see, you know, how, you know, I can escalate my access here. And the smart thing that the attacker has done uh, with this specific campaign here is that they've actually used Microsoft's own weapons against, you know, the users, right? So, you know, hosting a credential harvester into a live.com link and then masquerading that link behind uh, the Microsoft URL shortener service, right? So now from, a, from the perspective of, hey, does this look legitimate? Well, it's using a Microsoft shortener link, right? That's kind of lowers my guard a little bit in the first place. And then if I do tap on it and the page renders, I see this OneDrive.Live.com address show up, like that must be legitimate, right? And if I've done a good job at branding it properly and making it look very legitimate, right? Then my level of success here will probably increase pretty, pretty well here. Uh, and then again, you know, systems don't necessarily scan internal mail the same way that they scan external mail, uh, and those tend to be a bit more effective. So type threes, right? So again, evolutionary pressures, right? So now we're telling users, go change your password, make it more complicated, don't reuse password. We, we're going to implement multi-factor to log in. So now attackers are basically saying, all right, so, so much harder to break into the company. Well, who do you do business with, right? So, and, and, and this, you know, varies very greatly in terms of who I can go and breach, right? And often we kind of think about, you know, maybe I'll go out and, and kind of breach the legal firm that you do business through it, right? Maybe I'll go breach, you know, a more interesting target. But often we forget that the smaller companies that we do business with are the ones that get targeted here, right? So think about the custodial company that you do business with. Think about the catering company that you do business with that might be bringing snack or lunch, you know, on a daily basis, right? And often, you know, these companies, you know, you've been doing business with them for the last 10, 15 years, right? So you trust these guys, right? Um, and also attackers understand that, you know, as, you know, as a large corporation or even a, you know, mildly sophisticated company, I may be spending enough dollars on cybersecurity to protect my users, my organization. But that small company that I partner with, right, it's a, you know, maybe it might be a, a three people uh, mom and pop shop, and I know they're not spending any dollars on cybersecurity, right? So now, if I can breach these accounts, I can impersonate, you know, the, the catering company, right? Now I can start manipulating invoice. I can start manipulating banking information to now say, hey, you know what, we just changed banks, right? Our routing number and our bank account information has changed. So next time you pay us, can you send, you know, the payment to this account instead of where you've been sending, to, right? And also the attackers here are taking advantage of the fact that often we're not looking at our own sent out box, right? So now if I'm sitting in the inbox, right, and then I start a conversation with you, right? I can either redirect mail or I can re just remove the email quickly in your inbox such that you know, may not necessarily know this, right? And as, as I gain trust and I gain confidence in my own tactics here, now I may get, uh, you know, be able to pivot the conversation out of the inbox, or I may be able to do something a bit more, you know, sophisticated, a bit more bold, right? Um, and this is exactly what we see in these campaigns, right? So we, we call these long con campaigns, right? Uh, and they typically take more than one email to execute, right? So we, on average, we see it takes about, you know, a dozen emails uh, for them to be successful here. Uh, as I said, you know, the attackers will sit in the inbox, watch the traffic, see what's going on. And then, you know, if they have the right target, if they've reached the right person, right, start to move towards achieving your objective, right? Either it be financial or, you know, trying to breach the organization to exfil data, right? So, and then, you know, over, you know, a period of time here, you know, they'll effectively, uh, you know, get to their objective and get the monies 
or you know, and or, or we, what we've seen is that they may pivot the conversation out of the inbox again to avoid scrutiny because you know they you know the longer they sit in that inbox, you know they may get discovered, and you know by pivoting out of the inbox, uh, you know by registering a proximity domain. Um, you know, we'll, they'll often be, you know, gain a bit more confidence because now they know they're not going to get discovered. So here's an example of a, of a campaign that we've seen happen at a customer here. Um, so the attacker compromised a vendor of this customer uh, and actually sat on the mailbox for quite a long time because they knew that a renewal was up, um, but they, they, they wanted to time it correctly, right? Because if you strike too early, right, then something, you know, the, 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 the victim is going to say, hey, what's up here? Why are you asking me to renew, you know, early? Uh, and also the attacker here uh, was smart, right? When they asked for the renewal, they not only, um, you know, uh, asked for an increase in money, but they also asked an increase of money that was reasonable for the transaction, right? So they didn't go out and say, hey, you know what? The renewal is a million dollars where it should have been 200K, right? Because the moment you do that, right, the authenticity, the authenticity of the email kind of will start to raise some flags because, you know, that's not the price I normally pay, right? Or it's, that's, that's not my signing authority, right? So, um, so the attackers are kind of smart a little bit, you know, from that perspective. And also, you know, what the attacker did here is, you know, for a few dollars, right? So $6 on Google to just get a, you know, a, a real Google account, um, you know, and registering a domain that you can also, you know, do for, for, for a few dollars here effectively registered what we call a proximity domain, right? So in this case, you know, vendor.com versus vendor.com, right? And pivoted the whole conversation out, right? So copied the whole thread over to, to this new domain and now continue the conversation. And then if I'm not paying attention, right, I may not notice that domain is switched, right? And then I can effectively get to my objective. And, you know, if I'm successful here, you know, if I get 300K for the price of, you know, $20, that's not a bad deal, right? So I can definitely be successful here. So here's another example that we've actually seen at a customer as well, right? So this is a, a legal firm that got compromised, right? So the attacker sat into uh, the, the, the legal counsel's mailbox. Uh, I think the attacker here may have missed a bit of an opportunity to get a financial gain. Uh, what they did instead is effectively use, uh, you know, a FedEx impersonation email to probably try to get some credentials, right? So, um, so here, you know, the attacker just used that mailbox again, leveraged the fact that it was coming from a legitimate mailbox to inject their mail. And the other thing as well is often, you know, when we when we deal with trusted partners, uh, you know, some administrators out there may go and whitelist some of these accounts, right? So again, to not make to make sure that they don't get caught into the anti-spam, and attackers definitely do bank on that in order to be able to to achieve their objective here. So as we saw, you know, there's this, you know, constant pressure and evolution, right? And here, you know, we've seen this camp, this type, the different campaigns kind of change, get more sophisticated. And Kevin, you know, you, you dealt with this, right? What, what's your experience here? Like, what, what, what have you seen attackers do, you know, and, you know, has the different taxes that, that you've applied been effective and, and kind of seen that evolution occur over time? Well, I mean, I've seen all three of the types. Um, you know, when I first started to guess, it was a lot of type one, you know, hey, I need to update my payroll, direct deposit kind of thing. Uh, then we moved into the type two, and then the, the scariest one that, that we dealt with was a type three that took several months to really uncover the fact that it was a type three. Um, just because it was such a casual conversation between a trusted vendor of ours and overseas and a person that had been dealing with that vendor um, for several years, uh, just having a back and forth conversation around their kids and things like that. And then um, just then the, 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 I guess the fangs deployed and it was like, Oh, by the way, uh, I noticed on our last renewal uh, that we actually upcharged you. And so they're like, here's a new renewal with our new account information. Um, you know, let me know when we can expect this payment. That way, you know, we'll also re be refunding you the uh, amount you overpaid the last time. So that wasn't going to raise any flags except for the fact that like, well, that's weird that we actually went down in price. 
then that's what triggered the person that was on our side talking with uh, the the actor um, to reach out to our you know director of finance to say, hey, look, we're getting money back, um, you know, based on last year's revenue or whatever about last year's uh, uh, invoicing, and that made her question everything because she's like, wait a minute, why would we be spending less money on a product that you know we've been buying? And it's gone up, you know, 5% every year. Like now it's going down, you know, 10%. So that triggered her to ask the right questions, getting her involved in the email chain and CCing the original vendor uh, in which they realized that they were breached. Right. So it was, a, it was a scary moment where we could have lost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, it just took one person just to, to be happy about, saving money to to trigger a red flag um you know but i've seen a lot of other organizations and my peers in the industry and everybody else like they've gotten taken you know because mm -hmm. it's no one's ever asked the question but it, but it was fascinating to me that it was you know so cheap for this person to to do this to invest you know five minutes a day to send two or three emails back and forth to get people comfortable over the span of months and potentially could have walked away with hundreds of thousands of dollars. It just blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right. You know, it, it's, it's, it's good that, you know, your director just kind of like the light bulb come went off. Cause we've seen this happen where, you know, even the director and the VPs are approving those transactions. And, uh, and as these situations get raised is always a challenge of like, wait, 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 this is not real. Like you guys need to dig a little bit deeper into this. And then they realized that they were getting duped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 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 so as I mentioned earlier, right. So the, the challenges that a lot of solutions out there have is really not the right tool to solve the problem. Right. So as I mentioned, you know, spam, solving the spam problem is a very different challenge. Um, and phishing, you know, is, is, is you know you can kind of consider a bit of a variation of the spam problem, but it's definitely more targeted, right? So, and the solutions that are built today are definitely built around collecting samples, understanding what's happening, or just trying to understand what's the commonality around these different samples that I'm getting, so I can write a rule that can be fairly effective, right? And then the problem that this causes, is, you know, over time, you know, people, everybody will know everything, right? So, I will know how to block every spam, every campaigns out there. But the, the challenge is really that, you know, time zero when the campaign gets initiated. So what we typically find is that you get the spike of phishing coming in and then it tapers off over, you know, it could be a few hours, could be a few days, could be a few weeks. And we've seen vendors, you know, sit on a specific threat for literally two weeks before they push something out and figure out how to block those. And throughout that time, even the variation within those different phishing campaigns are changing a little bit, right? So could always kind of, you know, staying a step ahead of that new signature that's coming out and, and, and completely defeating those, right? So, so definitely making it a lot harder. And the other challenge as well is, you know, in order to collect these samples, was well, somebody got, you know, nailed somewhere, right? So now, you know, that patient zero is reporting it. And hopefully, you know, the damage was contained, right? All the other remediation, you know, tactics that, that are deployed out there are kind of kicked in to protect the environment. But often, you know, people get duped and then, you know, the dollars flow out and that's definitely a challenge. And um, when we look at, uh, you know, our, our customers out there, you know, often a lot of them will say, hey, you know what, I'm deploying stuff. Like I have email authentication deployed, but why am I still getting fish, right? So as I mentioned earlier, right, a lot of the measures, uh, a lot of the reasons why email authentication was really designed for was to tackle a lot of the spoofing, a lot of the spam problems that we're seeing, you know, about 10 years ago, right? So, um, so really kind of trying to authenticate that domain that's sending the email. But the challenge out there is that, you know, there's nothing correlating the proximity domain to the real domain, right? So I can go out and register, you know, Netflix with an one instead of an L, uh, you know, and, and still publish the right records and still have all this right and still pass email authentication, right? So it's really that payload at that point that becomes very difficult, that, that's where you need to inspect and where the nefarious you know, actions are happening. Um, and then the other thing as well, as we saw with those BC campaigns, right? Uh, you know, compromised accounts are happening, right? People are using 
you know, real accounts, right? Gmail, AOL, or like I said, compromising university accounts to send those emails, right? Um, and also with the rise of the cloud, right? The, you know, multi-tenancy is a great thing for companies, but it's also, it also has a dark side to it, right? So now, you know, if I'm publishing my SPF records to allow, uh, you know, to, to authorize, you know, uh, you know, 0365 to send out because that's what I'm using, the attacker that is also using 0365 will be able to, to, to pass those SPF records as well, right? So, so there's definitely a lot of good things, but a lot of bad things that are being used to abuse, uh, you know, those defenses. And we definitely need to go a little deeper, go beyond authentication, look at content in order to be effective. And the end result of that is when we do look at the efficacy of solutions out there, um, you know, we find a ton of stuff post existing solutions, right? So it doesn't really matter if you're the gorilla of the space out there, you know, the proof points or the iron ports, right? Uh, we see a lot of detections that are still happening post those solutions after they've called them out clean, right? Um, and what we actually see with a lot of our customers is, you know, they're, they're at a point where, you know, they, they're saying, okay, so either I have to drop my budgets and just move to a pure play, right? And often they find that, uh, you know, inappropriate and they're still missing things. Or we see this boomerang effect, right? So they go into a pure O365 environment or a pure Gmail environment. And now they say, that's not working out. I have to go back and look at a gateway or at technology I need to put up front. And here, you know, as, as we see, you know, those technologies are still missing uh, detections, right? And again, all this has to do with the solutions being reactive, built, getting enough samples in order to, to achieve that protection. Uh, Kevin, you, you kind of went through that, that kind of back and forth on technologies. What's your experience here? Well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with really efficacy. Um, that was my big one because we were getting spearfished multiple campaigns daily uh, before we landed on Area 1 as our solution. Um, but, I, you know, beyond efficacy, it really came down to the amount of management hours it was going to take to really handle everything and then with like a lot of the legacy you know secure email gateways out there um including the one we were using um it was manual rule writing constantly for things that were going to change the next day so it was constantly chasing our tails trying to figure out a way to stop targeted phishing um you know, everybody's going to be good at getting the the low-hanging fruit malware and spam that come through um, but the, the sophistication around spear phishing in general was, was lacking in everyone's sense. Also too, since we had a really strong push towards being a cloud centered organization, um, you know, there, there's a difference between being a pure bread cloud solution and being a VM in a data center and calling it cloud which is an issue I ran against when I was, you know, POVing a couple other uh, secure email gateways before landing on area one um, was, you know, for me to spin up an environment to stop an issue that I was having right now, how come it's going to take me eight days to get my cloud ready and uh, you know, time is money and, you know, potentially loss of money if we're getting spearfished on a regular basis. So eight days to, to set up even a proof of concept was not working for me at all. Um, but also too, um, when it comes down to what you get in Office 365, because we were an Office 365 shop, uh, a lot of that small low hanging fruit stuff could be handled by ATP. Um, a lot of that, you know, malware, spam emails, user uh, daily digest emails that, you know, people love, all that can be handled by Office 365. It's kind of what their bread and butter is. But when it comes to more sophisticated attacks, like you're going to, they're going to fall on their face. Um, you know, but not to say like they are a good part, you know, good product, but they're not a pure play security company. Um, so that's where, you know, the differentiator really work and i'm like why am i going to spend you know x dollars more on a solution that'll get me almost all the way there 
when I can get one that'll get me to what needs to be stopped now. And then the money I'm already spending on the other solution uh, can be used elsewhere. Gotcha. Gotcha. Appreciate that. So, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what can you do to secure O365, right? So, uh, so, so from a technology perspective, you know, as we mentioned, uh, you know, being reactive just doesn't cut it, right? So you really need to look at ways to just kind of try to think like the attackers, try to get ahead of those campaigns, right? Um, and this is a, an approach that we've taken at Area 1, right? So, so, so we like to call ourselves preemptive, right? Really by understanding what attackers are up to, uh, you know, what kind of campaigns are they weaponizing? What tactics are they taking? You know, what are they compromising, right? And, and also, you know, you know, ultimately the tools that the more sophisticated actors are going to deploy you know, we'll trickle down that pyramid of attackers and, you know, the script kitties on the bottom will use these tools, right? So, so what we effectively end up seeing is that uh, attackers, as they develop these tools and, you know, push them out and conduct their campaigns, we, we, we've deployed a, a network of sensors that allows us to monitor that. So, right, so effectively just looking over the shoulder of these, of these attackers to now understand, okay, what campaigns are you doing, right? So who are you going after? What are you compromising? So is it a WordPress site? Are you using Amazon buckets? Are you using Azure to host your, your, your payloads, right? So now uh, once I have that data, right, we turn around and feed that into a high-speed crawler to now say, well, where else do we see that, right? Because we know other people are going to try to use these tactics, right? And then our crawler has the capability to run pretty extensive analysis on the data that gets pulled down. Uh, we, we do extensive detections across uh, the files, the web pages that we pull down, right? Do association based on the brands and the, you know, the logos that we identify and does that match the infrastructure where it's being hosted, right? We scan the, the servers that we know are more likely to be compromised a lot more often, right? And, and, and all this really kind of helps us get a good picture of what these attackers are up to. And then we take all this intel and we operationalize that through the email service that we provide and protect our customers with, right? But on top of that, you know, th that allows us to kind of pick up what I call the low hanging fruits in terms of understanding, you know, the URLs, the files that attackers are using. But when it comes to BEC attacks, those campaigns are a lot more sophisticated, right? Leveraging that preemptive data, as well as understanding what messages are about, right? So if you look at, you know, some of the samples that we had earlier, right? There's no attachments, there's no URLs to, to, to detect on, right? So it's really the back and forth, it's really the language, it's really, you know, the real life actions that are being asked. And this is where, you know, if you think about the amount of compute that is needed to be able to detect those, that, that, that becomes very expensive, right? So, and if you're using a solution that is appliance-based or like, you know, Kevin mentioned, an appliance that's been virtualized and put in the data center, right? You're still bound by a lot of the limitation of those architectures, right? So you have to be able to scan deep and that is very expensive, right? That requires a lot of compute. Um, and also you have to be able to understand not only the message itself that you're inspecting, but also the overall context of that message. Is it part of a larger thread, right? And, you know, what's been going on historically between the back and forth between the senders, uh, the sender and the recipient, right? Your, your system also has to be able to, to create what we call this, uh, this, this partner social graph, right? So be able to understand who do you normally do business with? Who are the people that are receiving these emails? And can you categorize the emails and those recipients those emails are receiving, right? Because the transactions that a, that a, final, that a, that a finance person is having versus an operations person versus illegal resources is very different, right? The nature of those conversations are very different and the partners and the people and the different domains that they interact with are very different as well, right? So all these signals together have to be taken into account and because just by themselves often are not enough to create a detection, but together, right, that's how you say, hey, you know what? That transaction, that email conversation that's going back and forth that now is asking to change bank account information or doing something very unnatural raises a signal, right? And those signals are what you have to be able to recognize and be able to make a detection on without, you know, creating a false positive here, right? So, so as I mentioned, you know, the ability to create this interaction or to create this map of interaction across, you know, the different senders and recipients that are happening right, is extremely important, right? Because that's what's gonna help 
validate that the account's been compromised, but also if you think about the amount of, you know, not only compute that you need to, to do in order to kind of correlate all this data together, but you need the intelligence, you need the algorithms, you need the ML models, you need the AI behind that in order to say, hey, you know what, all this is all related or it's not related at all, right? Or, you know, the situation where, you know, a, a, an attacker out there will go and register a proximity domain to pivot the conversation. You have to be able to detect that, right? Because from a human perspective, right, if I'm reading my email on my mobile phone, for example, I may not necessarily notice that the domain has changed, right? Because I'm not necessarily tapping, you know, the, 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 the sender of the email to notice that is now, you know, vendar.com instead of vendor.com, right? Because the whole thread, the whole conversation feels very authentic because I've been going back and forth because these are my words that I've been saying, but the attacker has pivoted the whole conversation out. So, you know, all this uh, fraud prevention, you know, has helped our customers, you know, be protected, right? So, uh, you know, we've had very great success on, uh, you know, blocking these attacks going from the type one, type twos to the type threes. Uh, and, you know, the millions of dollars that we've protected, right? So, you know, over $273 million, you know, quote, quote, saved, uh, you know, by our customers here, you know, has been tremendous, right? And, you know, and, and some of these attacks, you know, go from, as I mentioned, the basic, give me a couple of gift cards, right? To the more sophisticated one where we've seen, you know, attackers try to subvert literally 20, 25, $26 million out of an account, right? And these are, you know, obviously not small amounts of dollars, right? And it can definitely impact, uh, you know, organizations. And often, you know, once those are gone, you don't necessarily get those back. So, um, you know, from a, uh, you know, best practices perspective, right? There's a few things you can do today, you know, right out of the box, right? As I mentioned earlier, early on, right? The challenge that a lot of our, you know, our customers face when they, they deploy Road 365 is that they don't necessarily know what to turn on, right? What, what are the right knobs I need to enable, right? And, and often, you know, if you're small, you know, Microsoft doesn't always care so much about you, but if you're a bigger brand, you know, they'll deploy, you know, a team of SEs, a team of architects to kind of help you, you know, kind of work through that transition or to kind of help secure your environment. If you complain enough, you know, they'll, they'll give you a resource to kind of help you. But out of the box, a lot of people tend to miss a lot of the basics. Uh, and, and, and here are just some things that, you know, that, that probably you should take a look at, you know, within your own best practices to see if you're preventing some of those things because we know this is what attackers are doing, right? So, you know, the classic mailbox forwarding, right? So this is the one where, you know, I put a rule to forward every email outside of my mailbox, right? So you can either do that at the account level, at the mailbox level, but general good practice, you should just not allow it altogether, right? So typically when you look at your own business uh, practices and your own business processes, there's no good, le good legitimate reasons to be forwarding mailbox uh, messages out of the inbox, right? So folks should definitely be using, you know, the box the way that it's intended, right? So if I'm replying back to you, right, I should be using that account, right? Why would I be replying out of my Gmail account if I'm con conducting legitimate businesses, right? Um, and these are things that attackers will do, right? Especially around those type three, right? Since they may not always be uh, sitting in that inbox, right? They'll put that rule in and then they'll just get every copy of mails being sent out and then they'll understand and then and they'll study their targets, right? Uh, the second aspect of things is, you know, secure your logins, right? Uh, implement multi-factors if you can, right? So for example, here, you know, in area one, not only I have to type in a token to log in, but we also have certificates deployed on our laptops, which means that only my company issued laptop can access the services that I'm allowed to access, right? So these are all things that, you know, that's gonna just gonna make the, 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 the barrier a little harder for the attackers to go through, right? Um, and, and these are things that, you know, out of the box, Microsoft doesn't tell you to go implement multi-factor. I think these days they're kind of making a stronger message around that, but if you've been a customer for a while, right? And you're not doing that, you should definitely consider doing that, right? Um, on the email authentication side of the house, right? So we talked about, you know, SPF, DKIM, DMARC, right? Uh, if you are doing it, if you are enforcing DMARC for your own domains on the way out, right? Do it properly, right? So we often see deployments where, uh, you know, the, the percentage of messages that should be, uh, you know, enforced is only five, 10, 15%. That doesn't really do anything, right? And, 
And on the inbound side of the house, definitely do do enforcement, right? So if the policy says quarantine on failure or drop on failure or reject on failure, like you should definitely do that. Don't, del- don't accept it and still deliver it because that defeats the whole purpose and the whole point of email authentication, right? Um, number four, you know, keep the junk out of the inbox, right? Often we feel that, you know, users are going to be missing out on something, um, you know, but if it's junk, there's no reason it needs to reach the inbox. Just throw it away, right? Because um, often attackers will take advantage of that because they know that, you know, not all engines are 100% positive on detections. So stuff that might kind of just be on the borderline and gets delivered to the, to the junk folder, that still gives a window of opportunity to interact, right? Because often, you know, users will get bored. They'll start to look in the junk folder and say, oh, what's that email, right? I'm supposed to tap on that and then they'll tap on it, right? So if you can avoid every interaction, um, you know, try to do that. And finally, if, if, if you feel that, you know, you're not getting what you need out of 365, you know, when you do look at an email security solution, uh, you know, do, do, do your diligence, you know, look at all the aspects that we talked about earlier around, you know, the, the deep analysis to, make, to, do, to be really good at detections, right? Just think about that preemptive approach to solving the problem. And also, um, you know, the, the word cloud here, you know, we've been kind of harping on that, you know, uh, a lot here, right? Make sure you get a true cloud solution, right? So that VM in a data center, that's not going to cut it, right? Again, because of those limitations and all the, the challenges that you'll face with, uh, with, you know, a virtualized piece of hardware. So, so we, so, so what we're talking about here, this is not something that we just kind of dreamt up, right? Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we work with our friends like Gartner here to just kind of help them through their own analysis. And, uh, and earlier this year, they've actually released a report around uh, the challenges of BEC. Uh, this report is actually available through the Area One website, right? So feel free to go and request it. Uh, you know, we're more than happy to share the data out of uh, this report. Uh, but the, the key things that you want to remember out of this report is that one, the problem is not getting any better, right? So, you know, I hate to be the, the naysayer and the, the bearer of, of doom here, but, you know, attackers will continue to adapt. They will continue to find ways to be effective at their own campaigns. Um, so, you know, uh, there, there are some good recommendations in there. We, we have talked about some of the recommendations that you should do to kind of defend yourself against some of these campaigns here. But also the key component of that is really, you know, choosing that next generation email security product, right? Again, you know, th- th- they will definitely mention cloud being a, def- a definite aspect of that. You know, we've, challenged, we've, we've tackled that challenge by building a true cloud infrastructure, right? So every email that gets processed by infrastructure is processed by its own dedicated piece of, of compute that allows us to go deep, especially when we need to do that, you know, natural language processing. We need to understand, you know, the relationship, build that social graph. And also it allows us to process faster, right? So we don't have to compete for resources. So on average, when we do process messages, it takes us about 1.8 seconds to process that message. And then we can, we can bring back that functionality back to email, you know, how it used to be, right? So delaying email 15, 20 minutes these days is no longer acceptable. So you have to be able to render detection uh, 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 dispositions very quickly and be able to be accurate about it. So what we find with our customers that deploy uh, Area 1 is that, you know, the, the return on investment, the total cost of ownership, you know, is, is totally beneficial to them, right? So they get a 30% uh, TCO return uh, on the investment here. And then from a deployment perspective, uh, our deployment approach is very quick, right? So we're entirely cloud-based. We integrate very seamlessly with, uh, with solutions out there. We can either be deployed as the MX record or we can be deployed behind technologies to reinforce those technologies. And, you know, our, our provisioning process takes a few minutes. Our deployment process can also take a few minutes, right? So we've done uh, deployments with customers, you know, within 10 minutes. And, you know, nine of those was really talking about what we're going to do next to deploy, right? Uh, so very seamless, very easy. And, um, you know, by being able to catch those, 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 uh, those phishing campaigns that are happening, catching those interesting BCs out there, right, has decreased the amount of, of time security teams have to spend, you know, dealing with those reported fish because they're being missed by, by um, you know, by those solutions. Um, Kevin, anything you want to add here? Anything, uh, talk about a value that you saw when you added Area 1 at Guess? I mean, 
the biggest value I saw was my fishing problem stopped. Um, so that was that was my by far the biggest value. Um, then price and everything else. But um, no, I, I think I think just the ease of deployment and the ease of management was was a big was a big win too because um, I, had, I had a small team. I guess I mean I wasn't you know some giant enterprise security team, um, but the fact that I didn't have to either dedicate my time or somebody else's time to constantly be writing rules within a SAG to, to block things for a day. Um, that was hugely beneficial. And then we can, you know, better spend our time elsewhere. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, we always tend to forget that the cycles that our people are, you know, spending trying to solve this problem can definitely be used, you know, more motion filling to somewhere else. Yeah, so, so quick recap here, right? So, uh, you know, phishing campaigns will continue, right? And as we saw, the attackers will always find ways to beat systems, right? The entry point is very low. And also, if I'm an attacker and I buy my own 365 account, I can probably use it to test my campaigns. Because if I see that show up in my inbox and I, if I point the cannon at you, there's probably good chances that it will show up in your inbox as well, right? Uh, BEC, as, as we said, are getting worse and worse, right? We are, you know, we talked about type one, two, three, because uh, I, mean, I mean, I mentioned this, you know, type four is on the horizon, right? We're seeing that definitely that increase of sophistication happening here. Uh, and, and these are definitely things you want to kind of keep an eye out for. Uh, you know, email authentication, right? Don't get that false sense of security around email authentication, right? Uh, there's easy ways to beat that. Uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, attackers who know that will find ways to defeat it very easily. Um, and then, you know, your SCGs that you have deployed today are relying on reactive technologies. So you definitely do want to get ahead of that. And again, cloud, right? Use a real cloud technology. Don't use a, uh, you know, what I call a fake cloud here, right? Like Kevin said, a VM in a data center is not cloud, right? Um, so really, you know, do focus on these different aspects that are, that, are, that will allow those deep inspections that will allow those accurate detections to occur. So, you know, I definitely do appreciate the time that you guys have spent here today, right? So, you know, if there's a few things that, I, you know, I would want you to, re to remember here, right? So from, uh, you know, everyone here, our technology is prevent. I, I, Microsoft seems to be doing a good job and I just want to kind of augment, right? Uh, you know, we can deploy, so we have uh, native integration, tokens or we've got time all right so the first question is so from uh you know everyone here our technology is prevent uh, preemptive right this is the part where you know understanding attacks understanding what the bad guys are up to right will make the solution a lot more effective right we we're a comprehensive technology right so you know email is only an aspect that we've talked about today right attackers are definitely taking advantage of the weaknesses around the various email deployments out there. But, you know, think of phishing as a people problem as well, right? So your employees will open their personal email on company assets, right? They will surf on social media sites. These are all a cost. Um, and again, to reinforce that, uh, that, allows us, that allows you to consume our services, you know, at a nominal cost. Um, and again, to reinforce and protect the infrastructure area you have today. So 